people focused on the god of humanity. It's hard to remember, but the Bible clearly says that God made all life. By that we don't just mean humans, we also mean plants and animals. Now regardless of whether you accept evolution or creation, if God made the world, that naturally includes the animals. And that we can all agree. Except we can't. Naturally there's going to be a case of one thing or another, we're going to be fighting over it. In which case, here I've been doing general research, including on Bible Flockbox, when I did my original video on him. I found one of Greg's videos on creation and evolution, which mentioned irreducible complexity, the genetic barrier, and lack of evidence in the fossil record, among other things. Now he suggested googling animals that disprove evolution to see examples of this in action. Now to be fair, that video was way too long as it was, and this isn't going to be much shorter, so I couldn't do the entire topic then. So I decided to leave it out and focus on the broader picture. However, when researching the other videos I've been doing recently, I came across something from another channel that I glanced at when I was doing something completely different in June. It was The Truth Hurts. If you haven't seen before, it's run by a former Jehovah's Witness named Harrison, who, as far as I can tell from the one video of his I've seen in full, lost his faith after studying the biblical flood. However, I saw one of his videos that said there were animals that disproved God, five of them in fact, which makes me think he's trying to angle an attack similar to that of the creationists going against evolution. Since both schools of thought are trying the same attack style, I felt this might be an ample opportunity to step up and do the thing that my channel is meant for. Trying to intervene, address both sides of the argument, and try to find a middle ground between the two extremes. This is very much like standing in no man's land waving a banner that says, can't we all be friendly? All I can say is, God help me in this endeavour. Let us begin. We'll start off with Harrison's video, which is on the negative side, saying that God doesn't exist and these animals prove it. Now, Harrison does something pretty good first off. He narrows down which god we are talking about in this examination, what he is in terms of his aspects, and what his powers are. He does this by hypothetically and unironically putting a Jew, a Christian, and a Muslim in a room to discuss this very thing. It seems irrelevant at first, and I certainly thought it was, but it serves a purpose of being all-inclusive. Since, when talking about God, we are generally referring to the Abrahamic God, which Harrison refers to as the monotheistic God, though this is being nitpicking, he misses out the Sikh, who are also a monotheistic religion. Whether he did this in person, found such a study, glanced over the collective text, or just assumed based on what he knew already, Harrison came up with a list of these aspects. Love, kindness, justice, empathy. And he had to choose one power, so he fought the power of foreknowledge. All perfectly reasonable ones, though whenever someone says foreknowledge in relation to God, 
I automatically think they're going to narrow it down to the point where it's just going to be God knows the future. Therefore, there can only be one future. It is not the case. The moment you factor in free will, there are a myriad of potential futures that just put this theory on its head. So, this is getting rather ridiculous already. Just to clarify my point here, if we didn't have free will, there would be no such thing as human evil in the Bible, as God will be able to sort it out. Also, he seems to be focusing on the extreme end of the spectrum with the hardcore creationists, saying that they, since they're the ones that are putting forward all these animals that could be proof of God's existence, and Harrison's using other animals to prove other ones. So I'll go easy on him if I can, and give him the benefit of the doubt. I will say straight away, though, I like the fact he justifies the living animals of the day by sniping at those who say the fossil god is fake and the fossils themselves are put there by Satan, which is common enough amongst some religious extremists. But it's worthwhile mentioning that it's not just religious people who don't believe in evolution. I myself believe in evolution and accept it. But a friend of mine who studies medical science and, as far as I'm aware, doesn't believe in a personal god, doesn't actually believe in evolution. I mention the personal god because I'm assuming this is the hallmark that atheists look for in people who makes no sense of anything. All that out of the way, let us crack on. I was never traumatised by bedbugs, either the thought of them through the little nursery rhyme or the little critters themselves. Now these are tiny little bad sucking creatures, but unless you are seriously locked in a place where they'll be crawling all over you day in day out, you don't really have anything to worry about. Harrison does give the perspective of a pet locked in a cage and putting all manner of fleas in there with them. But that is not the case. Everyone's like small enclosed spaces and come out at night to get their feed in, which is perfectly reasonable. But if you bear in mind that we humans don't live in cramped conditions and we generally move around during the day, bedbugs only really worry about, are only worrying for us eight to nine hours a night, unless you're really active on it, obviously. And they don't actually cause a great deal of harm. There's no evidence they spread any diseases, and once they do drink blood, it's an absolutely tiny amount. Harrison, it is 5% of a mosquito's blood portion. And it takes them 10 minutes to draw their tiny amount. To put it in perspective, you would need a hundred thousand of them, all drinking from you at once, before you can start feeling bad. But if you got over a hundred thousand bedbugs in your house, then clearly there's something wrong with your housekeeping, which is something I God doesn't really have anything to do with. It's your job to keep your house clean. If you're not going to take care of it, then quite frankly, you deserve to get all manner of food. In fact, it might not be the bed bugs that you're worrying about, it's the badger living under your bed. Now, I know Harrison made a very good point about this is a natural creature taking a natural blood transfusion to keep itself alive, and yet the Bible apparently forbids us from giving blood to people who need it. I personally think that's more a biblical interpretation issue rather than a problem with what we want. So to go over the aspects, which he doesn't really do much, of 
he then was doing their own little thing. Kindness. Not really a problem for us, they're tiny little things. Justice, empathy. There's there's really nothing in here that goes against all these all these things in the list. So I don't see why Harrison says this disproves God. Apart from the one aspect that apparently goes against one of God's teaching. He use a living creature to show that blood can be transferred, there shouldn't be a problem. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of Snape, I'll freely admit that, but I think Harrison is going a bit far with this. Firstly, I want to address something. Whilst Genesis 1.30 seems to suggest that all animals, including snakes, were vegetarian at one point. In my studies on Genesis 1, which I will link below, it strongly suggests that Genesis 1 was a vision given by God to Moses. And all this is written down to the scribes so they could use it for record keeping. Since it never specifies any animal to eat the plants, just in the beasts of the earth, it can very well be that the creatures Moses was able to see in the vision were grazing animals. Think about it, grazing animals don't really move that fast, and in a vision where you had to grab Limited death front and centre, you're going to be seeing a lot of grazing animals moving along relatively slowly compared to the predators who are dashing out of sight. As for mankind, it could have shown either early fructivorous hominids or even early hunter gatherers. Furthermore, if we take it literally, Certainly, snakes were needed to go from vegetarians to mesocarnivores in less than six hundred years or in less than a hundred years. But by that same logic, mankind would have needed to go from fructivorous diet to a carnivorous diet in less than a generation. I mean, literally, Adam and Eve eating fruit in the garden to their sons, Cain and Abel, one of them being a livestock herder. You need to eat meat in order to make that a worthwhile occupation. And remember, early humans were lactose intolerant. So the milk wouldn't have been a thing. They couldn't drink that. Now, I know what you're saying. Snakes are cruel creatures. They kill them discriminately. Snakes eat only what they need. They'll only kill what they need to eat. And they're actually pretty efficient predators. And since the euthanasia crowd say the reason why they want euthanasia is because it makes a quick, clean, quiet death, there you have empathy showing that God knows the pain of the creatures and therefore gives a means of killing them. Quick and easy way. Kind. It's quick on the snake. Love. Moving out the laws. Is it justice? Justice doesn't really apply to natural laws since out in the wild you're not really worried about who's going to be blamed for what. You're more focused on survival. Snakes have to survive. Born knowledge doesn't really come into this because. Well, snakes haven't really bothered us humans much. There's only more insects that cause more trouble. A box jellyfish. They are the most venomous creatures on the planet. Why? Because they also need to kill their prey very quickly. This is important because once they do swim after their prey, the bigger the prey they get, it can hurt them and swim away without them ever getting a meal. 
Granted, they do feed mostly on zooplankton, including baby fish and so forth, but they can eat full-size fish and crayfish as well, both of which can cause harm to them. Yes, their stings can be fatal to humans, but if you're going to be swimming in waters with one of the most lethal predators on God's earth, you're not really in a position to complain, are you? Plain sim- plain and simple. Whilst the aquatic ape theory is a thing, and I subscribe to that theory, we are, for the most part, terrestrial animals. We do not need to go into the sea. And if we do, we rarely have to get our feet wet. We have brains. In fact, it's believed God chose us to stop being because we have brains. Plain and simple fact is, one way to make sure you don't get hurt is to avoid being the areas where you can get hurt unless you're protected. Yes, Harrison is right that some areas of Australia need to have a bottle of vinegar in case someone gets stung by box jellyfish. But that is us being sensible. Having a means of sorting out the sting. It's worth remembering that since records began, which was sometime in the 80s, I think, there have been, all told, I think only about a hundred or so deaths, or even just stings, by box jellyfish. I'll try to find the link and leave a picture of it on screen. So even if we put ourselves in harm's way and God's God doesn't help us that way. It's clear we know what we're doing and we can sort ourselves out because the death rate is remarkably low from box jellyfish. Trying to find statistics for box jellyfish stings is very difficult. Though, from what I've been able to find about most jellyfish, as nearly all jellyfish have some form of venomous sting, more than 19 million people worldwide are treated annually for jellyfish stings. But since the box jellyfish is only one species, and Harrison primarily mentions one particular one, it's not easy to narrow it down. Though, since we know they live not only around Florida coast, but also the Philippines. It is estimated that up to 40 people per year die from a sting that comes from a jellyfish. And since box jellyfish are pretty venomous, the likelihood of it being them is high. But that doesn't help us much. If any of you find any more statistics, by all means, mention the comments below. Other sites suggest that there are between 100 and 200 people killed by box jellyfish in Southeast Asia every year. And also there are countless numbers of near fatal or seriously painful stings. However, since since stings of a box jellyfish are incredibly high in fatality, the likelihood of it being one of them killing you is well high, but also thousands of people die in Southeast Asia from many other things, including road accidents and other diseases. So, box jellyfish don't really contribute much to the overall mortality rate of Indochina. Mosquitoes are most well known for spreading parasites, bacteria and viruses that cause all the deaths. So saying that they're the killer is like saying a bus killed your son rather than 
the bus driver. This again, however, all builds on the single timeline belief that constantly happens when people say God has foresight. It is true that you can also see alternative futures. I'll say it again, for example, killing baby Hitler. It may save millions of lives in the Holocaust or World War II. Does that mean millions more lives won't be lost because someone else decided, you know what, I'm not going to remove the Jews from Germany. I'm going to keep them. And all oh, those two men, they're, they're Jewish, but they know things about the atom. We can get big bombs made. And hence Germany ruling, ruling Europe by means of the atom bomb. It is worth our remembering where that knowledge came from in the first place. And whilst I was going off topic, it's certainly worth our remembering that just because we don't like the talk, if God is able to see every timeline, how dark would other timelines have to be in order for this one to be the better option? It's not a matter of what is the ultimate good in this game, what is the total evil, but what is the greater good and what is the lesser evil? Humans, I've said it many times before, are bastards. Claiming that we can be the top being when we cause a lot of damage to this world. And yet, Harrison is claiming that we disprove God because women have birth pains. If we had to blame God for some things, this could be one of them. There's no denying it along with back pain, dental problems, and increased risk of exposure. We can blame God for a lot of things that our bodies have really caused, and they're not really well designed. Yes, blaming all this on Eve and letting the rest of women feel the pain of birth forevermore, is going a bit far, but it's worth noting that if we were to accept it as true, then we haven't really learned from our mistakes. I mean, how many of us go down dark roads sinning every single day? Harrison also asserts that when we are faced with this situation, we have two options. First, that God made an inept, imperfect, and incompetent design. Or that God is evil and vindictive. These don't really count. Quite apart from the fact that the word perfect doesn't even appear in the Bible until Genesis 16. It seems to miss out one important point about birth. For any creature, it is a risk. Just because we don't always see animals giving birth in the wild or even domestic creatures, it's a risky thing. Egg layers have to look after their eggs and often the young that form after them. Live birthing animals have to provide for their young for longer than most other creatures. If giving birth and raising young was easy, we wouldn't be having this conversation at all. But the fact remains that we are, which means it's hard, but worthwhile. Having had my brother's partner go through all the effects of pregnancy, all the vomiting, all the morning sickness, all that sort of stuff, Saying it's terrible isn't wrong, 
But on a biological level, it's, it's spring cleaning, essentially. It's really all the nasty stuff that could affect the child. On a cultural level, it's a reason for the man to step up and help his partner, not to sit there and moan. I'm just saying that. I'm not saying that Harrison's going to be an ungrateful partner. It's just worthwhile remembering that us men, we have a responsibility to our wives in those times. I wouldn't say this, though. Even in the translation that Harrison uses, which is a heavily edited Jehovah's Witnesses version of the Bible, it refers to increasing the pain of childbirth, increasing the pain of pregnancy, not creating them. This stands up in the Hebrew as well, so it's not something that the Jehovah's Witnesses came up with and Harrison has ignored. No, it's right there in the Bible. If you take it literally, you can be caught. So tonight. But since a lot to say the story of Adam and Eve is a oral tale from the earliest times of man, it's likely to be taken as an explanation point as to why women struggle during birth. Similar to how the Tower of Babel is used as an explanation to why we speak different languages, even though not, not one chapter earlier in the book, it says that they scattered all forms of the land and learned to speak different languages. They just parted ways. Now, yes, Harrison does make a point that when looking for creatures that represent God, we tend to ignore the nasty ones. We don't mention how lethal a black mamba is. We don't mention how sharp a tiger's claws are. But that doesn't mean our beliefs are completely wrong. Sometimes we just remember that the God who made light also, by association, made darkness. In fact, that was one of the very first things he did. He separated light from darkness. It's like a carpenter always makes splinters when he works, or sawdust. Flint napper makes flexor sharp flint fly everywhere, and a metalsmith working with a lathe makes swarf. Now everything that comes from God is going to be pleasant. But it's worth remembering that we have free will. And that shows that God isn't a sadist. Because most of the evil that's in our world, we often experience because we're the ones that cause it. Harrison made some very good points with his, with his list, but love is a broader phrase than our English language can allow for, hence the Greeks having many words for it. Kindness can allow for a swift death, according to some AIs, apparently. Justice, that's a relative term, and doesn't always apply in natural laws, since life generally isn't fair and justice is considered fairness. Empathy, if God knows us and knows the future, he'll know how we feel, and therefore we can't imagine what he feels. And foresight is far greater than we are willing to wrap our heads around. So, even though Harrison says, no, we can't, we can't allow for that because God really knows everything and therefore we can't judge him, we just need to think about what could have been. It's not something that's worthwhile doing, but if we don't understand God, we have to. So, now for the other end of the spectrum. And we have the creatures that prove creation and disprove evolution. Now, Greg made it a very broad phrase to say, do the googling, you'll find it easy enough. So I'm trying to cast my net wide here. 
that many of the sites seem to focus on Chapter 5 of The Revolution Against Evolution by Douglas B. Sharp. This sounds full of fundamentalists, to be honest, picking one source and spamming it until it's dry. So, how good is it? With one glance, seems to give you an idea. He starts off by explaining his logical framework of the indirect proof. The way it works is to assume the opposite of what you wish to prove, proceed logically until you reach a contradiction or an impasse, then conclude the alternative is true. This is not altogether wrong and does sound similar to how many scientists operate, but it's hard to do when you don't understand the concepts that you're trying to disprove, like the process of evolution itself. Let's delve into which animals he selected as the ones that disprove evolution. My friend who studies medical science used a similar example of how it's hard to see the transition from a small mouse-like creature to a great big seafaring mammal that is the biggest thing in the ocean today. In fact, the biggest thing on Earth, full stop. That gives some transitions that have to happen to make that transition. For example, the nose moving to the top of the head, to the back of the head, actually. The internal the kind of fins, the torpedo body shape, salt management from drinking the water, and sonar. It's worth, it's worth remembering that the body shape will change with um, habitat changes, including bone structure, limbs, and of course. They would have to come about bit by bit in response to how the creature gets used to the water, assuming that's the environment it's going into. Isn't that? First things first, nose moving up. Well, you see that in creatures like capybara and crocodiles. They have their noses high on their head, certainly high enough they only need to put a tiny bit of their head out of the water in order to breathe, like many semi-aquatic animals. As for as they move into the water more often, their swimming style will changes, so their body changes to improve with it. Like we see in seals and otters, they begin to have bigger feet, bigger fins and so forth, because they're no longer walking on land. And that means they're actually gonna find it harder to walk on land. They become better at swimming than walking. It's worth remembering that some very small shrew-like animals in our in our time have something similar. I don't know what it's called, but even even if you just take even if you just take a mole for example, they've got big spade-like paws, and they're only very good at swimming. So just and that may put some. They put them both between the fingers and the toes, that makes skimming the water efficient, making the fingers longer, meaning the webs can be bigger as well, hence become thin to the direction, the feet can become more power oriented, and so forth. And since they're better designed for water, they stay in the water more often. Salt management and sonar are also ones that occur, but only when moving from fresh water to salt water. And in fact, it's believed that dolphins don't even drink at all, because, well, they just take what they need from the fish they're eating. Both of these will develop as they move more and more into the water. One thing that Douglas does say is what did the great whales feed on 
before they started on plankton? The answer is actually quite simple. The same as dolphins, same as dolphins. They would have eaten fish, squid, and even smaller whales. In fact, back in the day, back when the first whales were swimming in the sea, they weren't filter feeders. They were great predators. As an example, Basilosaurus. Look it up. The fossils are there. If you're willing to see them. They are closer to modern whales than anything else at the moment. But you can easily see that they could quite easily be hunters. And they do hunt pretty well. Or did at least. In short, things happen in their turn, and others happen as a result. Whilst Sharp tries using the example of turning a bus into a submarine, and says it can't be done, it's particularly it's still moving, that is completely misunderstanding illusion, and also worth remembering that it's better to start on the surface of the water before you start going down. So you can turn a bus into a submarine if you first turn it into a boat. That bell platypus is a very weird creature. There's no denying it. And the strange thing is this article focuses mostly on the things that make it weird without giving us much more. If anything, it just shows that Clearly understood categories of life, such as mammals giving birth to live young. Hang on, this thing lays eggs. Okay, birds lay eggs, but they don't suckle their young. Uh, this one does. Um, you can see, see where it's going. If anything, it's more, it's more something that can be used to show the potential of transgenderism. Also, they say the only other monotreme is the echidna, which looks completely different. Well, in a way, yes, they do look different. In the same way, a greyhound looks completely different from a Pomeranian. It could just be the fact I've been watching a lot of speculative evolution videos. We can link a few of those in the description below. And I can see the similarities between creatures that are adapted for completely different environments as with platypuses and echidnas. I'll just give you a few examples. You can see that the platypus bill is just broader, so we can go on wide area for scanning, and they have... Well, their heads are pretty much bolted straight onto their body. Not really much of a neck. The echidna is basically just a tiny little beak poking out from a bunch of forms. So it's not too far off there. Feet. Eh, echidnas have pretty sharp claws. Platypuses also have claws on their back feet. That's not too far off. Basically, one's adapted to a aquatic environment. The other's adapted for a burrowing environment. It's got a broad range, but both still are related. out a koala's unique environment that it tough through without a problem is far better than the article's previous attempts. Certainly a thick coat of fur can be useful in all extremes of weather. There's worth while mentioning that the double opposing thumbs are similar to the opposing claws of an osprey or a woodpecker. Woodpeckers are mentioned later down in the article. The situation of, of the index claw moving to the middle claw is an oddity. But after talking about an animal who many people thought was a hoax or a literal spit job, I think we can forgive evolution a bit of a liberty with a swapped claw. You're going to be nitpicking about that. It's not really worth it. They, they are similar to wombats with their R-facing pouches, but 
are completely different, is again similar to the echidnas being completely different from the platypus, but in this case it's more akin to the black bear being completely different from the polar bear. The main difference here is literally one climbs trees, the other doesn't. The annotation that Douglas clearly doesn't understand and failed to make a point on was the fact that they eat eucalyptus leaves, which are toxic to humans. He mentions it, but he doesn't really cover it in detail. But he fails to question how they were adapted to eat leaves. Before mentioning that just because an animal can eat toxic leaves doesn't mean it's perfectly fine for us humans. Animals generally have tougher livers. In this case, gut bacteria and deficient livers take care of things today, but how do those things adapt over time? I took a look and found that eucalyptus leaves tend to lose their toxicity when they dry out. And koalas have a very keen sense of smell. So it's not hard to see how one could have started eating leaves of the forest floor and as it developed a greater tolerance, they could start climbing over the fresher leaves until eventually they are very much the only eaters leaves. Granted, marsupials, including the wombat, the koala, kangaroo and the wallaby, are mostly kept in Australia. That was not a very good phrase, but I'll keep it anyway. They mostly live in Australia, but the American opossum is, well, in North America. That divide is pretty big. It's worthwhile paying attention to what people look at in terms of distribution of species, because it is actually believed in one of the fossil records that marsupials originally evolved in South America, and certainly other marsupial fossils existed across Eurasia. It's believed that whilst Antarctica, Australia and South America are linked as the great supercontinent Gondwana, the marsupials would migrate from Antarctica to get to Australia. This shows how distribution of species can change a lot. And I suppose why the opossum actually looks rather different from all the other marsupials. I mean, there's only really one that it looks even remotely like, and that's the Tasmanian Devil, or possibly the Phylocene as well. That's the Tasmanian Tiger. But that's what you get. For birds and fish, Douglas says that there are no transitions between sea and land, or earth and sky. Either you're made to be that way, or you're not. This is absolutely ridiculous. With flight, we can easily disprove that just by looking at how man did it. How man got up in the air. We clearly weren't designed to fly, and yet we fly across the world. Easily. Balloons were used for many years until the Wright brothers got their first heavier than air flying machine off the ground. It wasn't just something that was given to them by God, they had to work on it, and it started off with gliding. And it's worthwhile noting that gliding is something seen birds a fair bit. Also, Certain types of squirrel, lizards, frogs, snakes, and even fish. They can glide for long distances. Look up flying fish, flying squirrels, a Wallace's tree frog. You'll see all manner of examples of creatures that can glide remarkable long distances. This happened to the dinosaurs who 
have been shown in many recent fossils to have feathers. Microraptors and other such feathered lightweights were gliding around the Cretaceous jungles. Once you got gliding underway, it's just a matter of getting stronger chest and back muscles until you can start generating some actual down thrust. Then it's a simple matter of adapting how the wings are made until you're able to generate forward motion and hence much of the lift is provided by your forward motion in the wing. So that would have been carried out quite a bit by the fact you were flying through the air in the first place. After all, that's what gliding is for in the first place. For the transition from sea to land, however, that is a bit tricky due to the limited efficiency of gills in air. However, insects don't have lungs. They have something else. They have spiracles. They are effectively inverted gills, which take in the air and diffuse it around the body. They are passive breathers, not active. Interestingly, Douglas uses frogs as an example of how things don't change, whilst missing out one thing we all learn about frogs when growing up. I remember this. It was either in reception, I think it was in reception, visualising the classroom, but it might have been year one because we have one particular teacher teaching us about. But we know they all are born in water, in frog spawn, they turn into tadpoles, and then they grow into a mostly terrestrial creature. From purely aquatic to mostly terrestrial, in a very similar transformation to how fish made it onto land. If you think there's no transitional form, salamanders are around, they are very much a mixture of that, but also the humble mud skipper, a fish that spends much of its time on land but has gills. They are transitions, and there are many one fossil record. You just keep. Apparently, the fabled camel adder from medieval estuaries is the final proof of creation. However, it raises a question, and one that I think is very worthwhile. If God made a giraffe as it is, why does it have such a short neck? No, you heard me right. It definitely has a short neck relative to its legs. Yes, we think giraffes have very long necks, but in actual fact, their legs are, are longer than the neck. And if you look at any picture of a giraffe drinking from a pool, in fact, even the one that the article uses to show a giraffe with its long neck shows it had to spread its front legs, to sprawl almost to reach the water. It's not like a giraffe is unused to lowering its head that much. But they actually eat from the lower branches of trees. They don't always go for the tops, they go for the lower ones. Before those of you who actually read the article say it's to stop blood rushing to their head and give them a headache or having their head blow off, it has already got muscles in its neck to restrict the blood flow to the head. So that stops it happening. It's not hard to see this creature growing a long neck, this problem being more noted. I mean, it's easy to be caught by predators. So if one had something in its neck muscles that causes the restriction in the artery, thus make it more alert whilst drinking, you can see it being more likely to be aware of predators and hence passing it on. Plus, animals with far longer necks compared to their legs have been seen being perfectly capable of drinking without sprawling. This is a bad design. And it's far from unique to giraffe. If we're going back to the cetaceans, they lack one important thing, which is a swim bladder. This is a simple pouch that 
siphons of gases from within the body that create that are created when it moves between different levels of pressure in a water column. Very common amongst whales as well. This is why fish don't get the bends. Because they have these swim bladders. And it's also believed to be the origin of true lungs. They got bends, partly thanks to the orifice, and then being able to draw air back and forth. You, you get the idea. This is why fish don't get the bends. However, whales and dolphins have fully functioning lungs and lack swim bladders. So they the off gas into their bones. Put a video on this. This is not a perfect solution, but it's one that doesn't cause them any trouble because they are aquatic, not terrestrial. So giraffes do not prove God exists. If anything, it proves he's not very good at designing things. Anthony Douglas Sharp tries to show that God's work is perfect and unchanging, which it isn't. The example he uses either misunderstands the process of evolution or ignores the flaws that any perfect designer would have fixed long ago. In short, this fails to disprove evolution as is understood by scientific minds. So, Two different viewpoints from different ends of the spectrum. One misunderstanding the deeper context of how he describes God. The other misunderstanding and misrepresenting the natural world and its processes. Both with the same problem of taking things literally, without considering metaphor, without considering different ways of communicating, without considering stories and so forth. Neither of them made their point clear. God has a greater way of shaping the world than we can ever understand. So where do I sound this? I mean, I spent a ridiculously long time, in fact, it's over an hour actually here, trying to explain it all. So, why do I say both of them are wrong? To me, it's not any particular form of life. That proves it. Proves God exists. It is life itself. Statistically speaking, life as we know it should not exist. So many things had to happen for life as we know it to come about, and from life, creatures that could develop into us. And we should. And we still have to strike a delicate balance between maintaining our fragile existence. Excluding predator prey relationships, right? Stephen Fry, in one of his sketches with Hugh Laurie, has made a very good point. Too much of anything is bad for you. That is true. Too much sun can burn. Too much water can oversaturate your cells. Too much food can overload your system. Not enough of those, sir, can leave you in no better shape. Not enough sun and you will, well, die of vitamin D poisoning. Vitamin D deficiency, sorry. Not enough water, you will die of thirst. Not enough food, you will starve. In short, the production of cellular life was one of the hardest things to explain since it's not exactly a simple shift from randomly combining organic chemicals in a murky puddle to something capable of sustaining the right environment for those reactions to continue. Even in our bodies today, we need a vast biome of microbial life forms to keep those processes going while we wonder why it's possible. Even Darwin himself was not afraid to admit he didn't know how it was done, how it happened at first. So quite apart from the beginning of the universe, which is something that needed just as much pinpoint details to allow life to even 
have a chance of developing. If I was to pinpoint one thing that made human life possible and therefore proving God exists, it would be DNA and its enzymes. Without these things operating, life wouldn't be the way it is and evolution would be impossible. Therefore, life itself wouldn't change. And life does change, that's just the way it goes. So, to sum up, no individual animal proves or disproves God, but the fact that animal life is around to have the chance to be in this contest proves God exists, in my opinion. Choose to believe in him or not is your choice. But, in my opinion, it's like discussing Pluto. We can argue over whether it's a planet or not until doomsday. But we can't deny it. It's definitely there. Whether we choose to accept it for what it is or not. Thank you for watching this ridiculously long video. I'll try getting more of them short later on. Please subscribe to the channel, it really helps me out. And check out the links below to find my sources. Till next time, stay safe and God be with you.